Oh, well, thank you everyone for sticking around for the last session on a Friday. Um, I'm sure it was very tempting not to come back after the break. Um, I've got something quite theory light for you, so hopefully it won't be too heavy for at the end of the week. Um, so yeah, I'm Louise. I'm in my sixth year of a part-time PhD in sociology, researching the experiences of young people with chronic illness. Um, today, after briefly, briefly outlining my study, I'm not actually going to talk about my findings, but I'm going to focus it in instead on looking at what some of my participants told me they felt they'd gained from taking part, specifically in the photo task I asked them to do. Um, so I'll give some examples of potential impact from previous studies using similar methods and describe the task I asked them to carry out. And I'll then talk about how three of my participants reflected on what they felt they'd gained and how this relates to those potential impacts. And I'm going to finish up by suggesting why looking at this matters and how it might apply to your research. Um, so my PhD explores the lived experiences of young people um, aged 18 to 25 living with ME, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, this is a serious, complex, contested chronic illness, which is characterised by severe debilitating fatigue and a wide range of other symptoms that affect all body systems and which fluctuate unpredictably and increase following any sort of exertion. Uh, research is currently very, very underfunded, meaning there's a lack of understanding as to the mechanisms behind it and also a lack of effective treatments. Um, so to explore this, um, of visual and verbal methods. So I used episodic interviews, which are kind of like semi-structured interviews, but they ask for a series of short narratives about the topic being researched. Um, I also used participant-generated photos and captions, and then photo elicitation interviews to discuss these photos further. Um, almost all of this was done via Skype, which was a design choice in order to uh, make it easier for chronically ill participants, but it turned out to be very useful when we got to a pandemic situation. Um, today I'm going to focus in just on the photo related parts of the study. And so previous researchers using similar photo methods have suggested that the process of taking photos as part of a research project can give participants a chance to reflect on their experiences of the topic being researched, which they might find beneficial or therapeutic in some way. Um, by capturing specific moments from their lives, photos can act as catalysts to spark memories and narratives about both what is pictured and the context surrounding it. And finally, there's the potential to observe changes over time, both over the course of the photo taking and between taking the photos and then later discussing them. Um, so Frith and Harcourt, for example, asked women to take photos over the months of chemotherapy treatment, capturing the process of illness and treatment, and found that in the later interviews, participants both relived the past experiences pictured and also reflected on these past experiences from the present perspective, evaluating the changes that were made visible in the photos. So I asked my participants to take around 20 to 30 photos over a two week period, showing what it's like for them to live with ME. I also asked them to write a caption for each photo. Um, I gave them some suggestions here as to what they might take photos of, but I very carefully left it open so they could include anything that they wanted to include, anything they felt was significant and things that I hadn't considered. Um, so this resulted in 400 photos from 18 participants, uh, ranging from seven taken by one participant to one who took 63, and also captions that ranged from a single word to over 350 words. So today I'm going to discuss the reported impact of taking the photos and then discussing them on three of my participants. I'm going to use extracts from the photo elicitation interviews some come from the discussion of individual photos, while others come from the more evaluative questions that I asked them at the end. So about what they found it like representing their experiences, how they decided what photos to take and what it was then like looking back at them. I didn't specifically ask them if they felt they'd gained anything from the process. These were all spontaneous remarks that came up in answers to other questions. 
Um, before I start discussing these participants, I do want to note that reflecting on experiences of illness in this way could be difficult or upsetting because it involves thinking about all the ways that their lives are different, things that they struggled with or can't do or miss out on. Um, but if participants did find it hard, they often also recognised it had been a good thing in some way. Uh, it could be therapeutic to examine things they didn't usually think about, or it could offer a different perspective that they valued in some way, or it could make them proud of what they'd managed to do despite their illness. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that it was always a wholly positive experience. So first up is Georgina. Georgina chose to take her photos across one week while she was on leave from work and one week while she was at work, which was a relatively demanding and sometimes quite physical job in a hospital. Um, the first time we spoke, she told me that most of the time she didn't do a lot. She went to work and came home, um, sometimes struggling to eat before going to bed or having to choose between eating and having a shower because she didn't have the energy for both. Um, and she didn't really do much at weekends. She couldn't really see her friends or do her hobbies or even watch TV with her family because she didn't have any energy because she spent it all at work. Um, she was right at the start of a week off when we first spoke in the first interview and she told me that she wanted to have fun and do the things that she wanted to do during that week but still with an eye on not doing too much in order to then be able to go back to week work the following week. Um, the difference between what she does at work and on leave was something Georgina was clearly very aware of but it seems like seeing it in her photos rather than just talking about it made it even more obvious to her. So the photos she took during her week off included spending time on hobbies like sewing um, and traveling to see her friends, even staying overnight or going out with them. Although it's important to note that she also included photos of resting in between these activities. Uh, the photos from her week at work, however, were all about going to work, um, doing essential activities like eating or feeding her guinea pigs and resting. There was nothing fun in her photos from that week. And so this is what she had to say about um, the difference that was apparent in her photos. Um, it might seem a little bit odd that she found seeing this difference so clearly as being really good, um, because it almost seems to show that all she can do most of the time is work and rest. But I think it makes a little bit more sense if I tell you a bit more about her. Um, Georgina described feeling like she was stuck in something of a catch-22 situation. She very clearly loved her job and valued it and felt that it gave her a sense of purpose. Um, after having had a significant amount of time off sick because of an exacerbation of her ME caused by pressure at work, she made the decision to go back and to make work her priority, even though she knew she would have to miss out on all of these other things. Um, some months on from this, however, when we spoke, she was really missing all these other aspects of her life, her hobbies and the things that she liked to do for fun. And she was considering leaving and finding a less taxing job if things didn't continue. Uh, she was also thinking about ensuring that her adjustment of being of working part time was actually implemented all the time, um, preferably so that she had a day off in between each of her work days. The idea being that if she was having more regular days off, she might be able to do more on these days rather than having to spend them in bed resting and recovering. And I think that's what she's talking about here. Um, I think the distinct contrast between work and time off that her photos show made her feel like it might be possible to keep this job that she really loved and be able to do more of the things that she enjoyed if she was able to work less. And next up we have Rachel. Um, a lot of the photos that Rachel took, in fact most of them, didn't really make any sense until we discussed them because she only used single word captions. So we had things like curtains, breakfast, stairs and ceiling and that, that was all I got. Um, and then there was this one, which was simply called fork. And I had absolutely no idea why this fork in particular or forks in general might be significant. It was a complete mystery. Um, but the story behind this photo demonstrates how illustrating her life with Emmy for my research offered an opportunity to, to, for her to reflect on the progress she'd made over the three years or so since she became ill. Um, so Rachel told me about a period earlier in her illness when she'd been so ill that she couldn't actually feed herself because the fatigue was so severe that she was unable to lift a fork and take mouthfuls on her own. Now, when we spoke, she was still quite ill. Um, so she was only able to do a little bit of work from home for her dad's business. So it was very flexible. She couldn't cook for herself and she couldn't walk very far. 
Um, but thinking back to this more severe period that the fork represented, um, she could see that things had improved. As she says here, progress with ME can be excruciatingly slow and incremental, making it far less obvious on a day-to-day -day basis, because things don't really appear to change. But looked at over a long period, it becomes more noticeable. For Rachel, this was a positive because it enabled her to realise that while everyday life might still be difficult and progress might still be slow, things had improved. Uh, this, she did talk about the importance of recognising small improvements, like just being able to get up a little bit earlier in her first interview. She mentioned the importance of comparing herself to how things had been when she was first ill instead of before she was ill um, in the first interview. But it seemed like taking photos representing this made the progress a lot more tangible to her. And the third participant I'd like to talk about is Molly. Um, so for Molly, looking back at her photos a couple of weeks after taking them also showed changes in the severity of her illness, but over a far shorter time scale. She happened to be going through a period with a lot of really bad days when she was taking her photos. So a lot of them reflect this. They reflect what she does on bad days, how little she can do and how bad she feels. Um, so this photo, for example, um, shows that she was painting a set of drawers she brought, bought secondhand which isn't something that appears to be especially energy intensive, but for her at the time, it was very difficult. Um, when we came to talk about the photos, she was having a far better week and she was so incredibly surprised at how ill she actually gets and how ill she was when she took these photos. Uh, she told me that she never really remembers bad days or how many bad days she has or how bad they get. While being reminded of how difficult life with ME is was negative for some of the participants, Molly actually seemed to really appreciate seeing these aspects of her life that she usually forgets. It perhaps validates her because it's evidence that she's actually quite ill quite often. So she told me about how she felt guilty applying for PIP, which is a benefit to help with the extra costs of living with a disability or chronic illness, because she wondered if she was entitled to it, if she was disabled enough because she does have good days when she can do quite a lot. And she said that she has to remind herself that she only has good days because she spent several days doing basically nothing beforehand, just resting in bed. And that if she doesn't consistently do very little, then she has a lot of bad days. So she's clearly aware that she has bad days when she's in better times, but it's almost this sort of vague theoretical awareness as opposed to really knowing that she has them and how bad they are. And um, she said that I know my ME is not good, but I don't remember how bad it is until it kicks in again. So the photos of these days when she was struggling this much seemed to act as a reminder, something kind of concrete that she could look at when she was feeling better, um, that enabled her to remember what it's really like. So how does this compare to the potential impact in the literature? Well, a common thread linking these three participants is that the photos they took gave them a chance to reflect on the way their illness changes over time. Now, the time frame might have been much shorter than that that was used by Frith and Harcourt, for example, but the changes were still visible, either because they were reflecting on experiences from before the project started, because their illness behaves differently in different contexts, or because ME can fluctuate over short periods, even with a, within a single day. So several weeks could potentially capture multiple fluctuations and levels of severity. So for Rachel, this was about recognising progress that is slow and often invisible on a daily basis and seeing how far she'd come. But Georgina it was seeing the differences between work and time off. And the, this suggested to her that balance in her life might be achievable with a smaller change rather than the more drastic one she didn't really want to make. And for Molly, it was about seeing the fluctuations in the severity of her illness and having a more tangible reminder of these sparking memories that would otherwise be lost. And this acted as a reminder that she is ill enough to be entitled to support. So why does thinking about this matter? Well, I don't know about you, but to me, impact always felt like this kind of really big, scary thing. You know, the ESRC calls it the demonstrable contribution that our research makes to wider society. So I always thought about the impact of my research as being what my findings might do once the research itself was finished. Um, but talking to my participants about their photos made me realise that smaller impacts are both possible and important. 
for our ethics applications, we have to think about the potential harm from taking part. So for me, this was about the potential psychological impact of discussing sensitive topics and also the potential for exacerbation of their symptoms. But we don't have this same obligation to consider the potential benefits, what participants might gain from their participation. Um, but as I found unexpectedly, I suppose, they can gain something that isn't actually related at all to our findings or the potential impact of the findings. Just the very act of reflecting on their experiences to tell them to me could give the participants something valuable. So Georgina, Rachel and Molly all felt they gained something from the new perspective offered by taking their photos, something that was less visible to them in their daily lives or that they wouldn't have recognised so clearly. Um, obviously, the bigger, sort of bigger scale, more obvious type of impact is really important. But if your research involves people, I would encourage you to think about how taking part might have a positive impact on them. Partly, of course, because if it benefits them in some way, as well as being useful to us, that's important because we all care about both our research and our participants. Um, but it's also something that can benefit us because research is really hard. You know, doing a PhD is difficult and it can be easy to get kind of lost in it, particularly if you're stuck on something or struggling um, or things just aren't going very well. Um, and it can feel like you're never going to finish or like your findings are never going to make a difference in the world beyond meaning that you have a PhD when you didn't have one before. Um, but if you think about how your participants might have benefited, you already have made a difference. So every time I look at the photos my participants took and every time I read their words when I'm working with my data, I'm reminded that they told me that taking part had made a difference to them. Um, and that's a really nice kind of bright spot to have, because even if on some days it feels like my findings are never going to have any real world impact, um, this is a reminder that actually the project already has, and it doesn't matter if there's no more impact, it's already done something. Um, and there's some references, so thank you very much. <laughs>